Have you ever messed up in your life? Have you ever done something you wish you hadn't done? No, right? Those that said never just did, right? Uh, I was following my, uh, I was driving somewhere and I had my GPS on in my truck and it was telling me to go a different route than I normally go. And I thought, I'm much smarter than this machine and decided, no, I'm not going to go that way. And so I went down that road and lo and behold, there was construction and the road was blocked. I had to U-turn and go back the way it was telling me to go. There are many things in our life that we make wrong choices and God has to bail us out, doesn't he? He has to fix it. And uh, When I was a young boy in junior high school, how many remember junior high, not middle school? All right. Shows our age a little bit. It was Thanksgiving week and the day before Thanksgiving, we always had a half day of school. You get out early. Uh, so my buddy that I thought was a buddy uh, talked me into skipping school that day because nothing ever happened on a half day of school. And who would know? There's so many kids absent because it's Thanksgiving week. So he and I pretended to walk to the bus stop, hid out until the bus left, and then we... We went into his house after his parents left for work. And we kicked back with some frozen pizzas in the oven and just had a good old time. There was, back then, there was nothing on TV, I will tell you that. So I think you had guiding light and a couple of those soap. We, so at noon, when school was to be dismissed, I thought, you know, this is boring. I'm going to go home. So I decided to go home, and as I'm walking toward the door, my dad pulls in the driveway. Son, what are you doing home so early? I said, it's a half day of school, Dad. We got out early. He goes, well, you were to get out at noon. It's five after. Why are you home so early? Did, you, did the bus leave early? Did somebody give you a ride? I was busted. The school had called him to tell him I didn't go to school. I was toast in many ways, much like that frozen pizza we cooked in the oven. I I was found out. I I couldn't sit down for a few days, even though it was Thanksgiving. Uh, We'll just skip that part. There are times when we do something wrong and it's time to repent and give it back to Jesus. Amen? The problem is many times we don't admit or we don't want to say, Lord, forgive me. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, we read about David. Verse 1 says, Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So David asked the commander, uh, he said to Joab, the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and roll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of my Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king want to do such a thing? The king's word, however, overruled Joab, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. In other words, let me just put it in a nutshell for you. We don't have time to read all the scriptures this morning, but... David was patting himself on the back by counting the people of Israel. The commander said, listen, don't do this. God has blessed you. God has done all these things. You don't need to know how many there are. 
Because if God is on our side, we're going to win whatever battle we face. But David sinned. And he had them count anyway. When the nine, it took over nine months. Now, they didn't have the census like we do today where they send everybody out with a little clipboard and they report back in just a little while. Nine months, they walked the entire nation to find out how many fighting men there were. And when the report came back to David, the Bible says he realized he had sinned and done something wrong. So the, this anger, we see the Israelites over and over doing wrong. Not following God's GPS. Not doing what they should. Not going to school when they should, but skipping out. God wanted to bring Israel back to repentance. And He sent the prophet Gad to David. Now if we skip to... Go to verse 10. I don't know, Mindy, if you have all that. David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men and said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord came to Gad the prophet, David's seer. Go tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. The three options are, we'll just jump to the three options. Three years of famine, three months of fleeing from your enemies, or three days of plague. Three years, three months, three days. Most of us say, you know, give me the three days. I don't want something to last three years. Have you ever been through a problem that lasted a long time? It's painful. It's painful to wake up every day and you got this, the same old, same old. David said, give me the plague because I'd rather not be in the hands of man, but be in the hands of God. And God sent a plague to Israel, as you read there in chapter 24. 70,000 people died. That's pretty bad for the man's sin. 70,000. Can you imagine having that on your conscience? Having that difficulty? David repented and it says that as he was, this famine was killing 70,000 people, Verse 17, David saw the angel who was striking down the people. He said to the Lord, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. On that day, verse 18, Gad went to David and said to him, Go build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went to Aruna's place. We would call it a farm today. To build an altar. Now this guy who owned this land said, the king is here. Have whatever you want. Build an altar. Here's the wood. If you need something to sacrifice, here's my oxen. You can use the land. It's yours, David. And David said something very profound. You might have heard it before. I will not offer anything to God I will not offer a sacrifice to you that costs me nothing. I will not offer anything, Lord, that costs me nothing. When we go to God, when we come to an altar, we come at just with nothing. And we say, Lord, here am I. But God doesn't just want us to say that. He wants us to give us, for us to give our lives to Him. To surrender it all. That's the altar is that place. The altar is a place of complete surrender. Complete, Lord, I give you all. We, we know that salvation is free. We can't earn it. We can't be good enough. We can't do anything to receive what God has freely given. But when we surrender to Him, the Bible says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves 
a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. What some did around the altar today, what we need to do around the altar today is present ourselves a living sacrifice. I think back in my own life of times around the altar, times that God has really done something in my life where I've just surrendered it all. At age 12, I was in a large meeting and God just impressed on me to go to the altar. I went down and God said, I want to call you to preach at age 12. I told my parents, my mom wrote it down in my Schofield Bible. Greg called to preach and wrote the date down. And At age 17, my brother was already in ministry. My dad has, has been a minister all his life. I said, you know what, I think I think I was just in, caught up in the emotion that, that God really didn't call me. I just wanted to be like my dad. And so I chose to go a different route. But you know how God does. He starts putting these detours in our path. The GPS tells us one way and we're defiant. We go the other way. But God has a way of bringing us to His place. But I still had to surrender and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Here we have David. David had done so much in his life. He was anointed king as a young kid. He faced Goliath, killed him. He ran from Saul. He became king when he should have been out doing kingly things. He committed adultery and killed the guys, the killed the husband. They had a child out, out of that affair. That child died. He went through a lot. His son took the throne from him. He came back, but he had done so many things. In the previous chapter, we read about all the mighty men that fought with David and the great things that they did. There was one guy, Shammah, in the, in the field that stood and fought against so many. He fought so long that his hand froze on the sword he was using. When you get old, guys, you'll know what it is to, to get cramps in your hand where you can hardly move it. And You young people, y'all don't have to worry about that yet. His life was such a drama, he could have been on Netflix today and made a lot of money. Or at least a story. But it wasn't... The problem was, David was counting all these people, trying to pat himself on the back for look what I did. When it's, what has God done? What has God done? How has God supplied all this? So when he counted these people, he was saying, oh, look at my kingdom. But it's God's. What about your life and my life? All we are should be wrapped up in Him. All we want to be should be because of Him. Amen. The minute pride rises up, the Bible says pride cometh before the fall. So David realizes his sin. They're punished for it. And he does something God asked him to do, and that's build an altar. The altar is a place of sacrifice. It's a place uh, in the old tabernacle in the Old Testament, you walk in, there's an, there's an altar where they burn the animal. They sprinkle, they kill the animal, they sprinkle the blood, they burn it to atone for sin. To atone. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name, but not to forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. We no longer have to offer up animals and their blood for our sin. Jesus did it once and for all for us. But we are to offer up a sacrifice of praise, fruit from our lips. We have three options in surrendering. We can surrender to God, let me tell you, choose A, okay? 
We can surrender to the flesh, give in to the desires of the flesh, or we can surrender to the enemy. If you look at people today, they're doing one of those three. We're either surrendering to God, we're giving in to the things of the flesh, things that we desire, we want, or they're giving themselves wholly to the enemy to let him rule and reign over their life. What other choice should we make? Why is it so difficult for us to step into this place and say, God, I surrender all? Why is it so hard? We, I mean, I'm right there with you. <laughs> there are things in my life I wish I had not have done. The great thing about God is there's forgiveness. We get caught in all the stuff. We go down the wrong road. God is calling us back to Himself. And He said, I want you to come to an altar. Not necessarily around the front of the church. An altar is anywhere you find yourself giving it all to Jesus. It could be in your home. It could be beside your bed. It could be driving down the road as long as you don't close your eyes. Surrender to God. Lord, I give it all to You. I give away everything I am, everything I want to be, and I surrender it all to You. So many people go down the, the road of wanting everything for themselves. Our society, America, is so like that. We think if we don't have the latest, greatest, the newest gadget comes out, we've got to have it. We, we might max out the credit card to have the latest, greatest thing. We might be in debt way beyond our imagination because our car makes a few squeaks. <laughs> I surrender it all. When the end comes, when we stand before God, what are we going to say? Lord, man, I had the best car. I had the nicest furniture in my house. No. The Bible says, what did we do for Him? There's a movie, it's a number of years old, called Schindler's List. Some of you might remember that movie. Where a Nazi businessman saw the plight of the Jews and began to hire as many as he could basically paying off the Germans so they wouldn't kill them, not really using them in his factory, but keeping them alive. And at the end of the, the story, when victory was ahead, he had to run for his life, and he got into a car and said, I could have got so many more Jews out if I had sold my car. I could have got more out if I gave this wristwatch to them. What are we going to say when we stand before God? God, I could have done more. I could have witnessed more. I could have shared Jesus more. I could have done this or that when I wanted to put it all on myself. When I'd rather please the flesh. The altar is a place of surrender. But God wants us to worship. I read the scripture out of Hebrews. Offer a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice of praise. It says, from the fruit of our lips. In other words, give thanks to Him. Praise Him. It's more than just lip service. It's more than just saying the right words. The second part of that verse says, or in verse 16 it says, but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Don't forget to do good and to share Jesus with others. We get caught up in me, oh, I'm going to make everything right with God and me and God are good, but Forget everybody else. <laughs> That's not God's heart. God's heart is to, we share it with everyone we meet. We give of ourselves. We give all we have and all we desire to Him.
the altar is a place where we lay down our desires, our purpose, what we think our purpose is, and we surrender it all to Him. The second, there, there's four reasons for the altar. I'm going to do the other two tonight. But the first one is sin. Sin separates us from God. When we come and we offer ourselves, we say, Lord, take away what's keeping me from You. But the second part of that altar is we bring something to God. David said, I will not offer anything that cost me nothing. What does God desire from us? This isn't a sermon about the offering. Let me just tell you that. Uh, we do have a safe in the foyer for you to drop your offering in. But it's not about money. You can't buy enough from God. You can't give enough to earn anything from God. But it's surrender. What did Jesus tell the rich young ruler that came to Him? Sell all you have and give to the poor and then you can follow Me. And it says He went away because He was very rich. It, it wasn't that He wouldn't give it to, to God. The fact was He loved it more than He loved God. He loved what He had. There are things in our life that are not that are keeping us from God. Some of those things could be entertainment. They could be some hobby. For some, it's even ministry. We're so involved in ministry that we never sit down and have communion with God. We talk about, in, in church work, we talk about burnout, where you just... You go and you go and go and you just say, I just can't. i got to rest a little bit. pastor preached on this the other night. We have to rest in Him. It's not about doing, doing, doing for Him. It's about communing with Him. If all I do in my relationship with my wife is work with her and we never sit down and talk together, then I don't have a relationship. If all you do is come to God and you're begging forgiveness or you're asking God for something, then you need to work on that relationship with Him. We surrender. We, we offer ourselves, Romans 12, offer ourselves a living sacrifice. God doesn't want us to die on that altar. That's what Jesus did for us so that we might have eternal life. But He wants us to give our all. What is His ultimate plan? Think about this for the world. What is God's plan? God's plan, the Bible says in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's His plan. It's not some elaborate scheme that we got to work into. and do. It's just share Jesus. We can't share something that we don't know. The first thing you, uh, they do with people who are uh, going door to door is they teach them the product. They take it home, they work, they know everything about it. So that when they go into home and demonstrate it, or they don't do that anymore, but you know what I'm talking about. You have to know what it is. I have a gentleman that I bought many cars from. Works at a certain dealership. I go to him, he knows... It doesn't matter. I'll tell him what I'm looking for. He researches those vehicles. He knows them inside and out. I don't have to worry about figuring out what this button does. He knows all that. Good Christian man. What do I know about Jesus? Do I have that relationship with Him so when people talk to me, when I talk to someone else, I can share Jesus with them? But at an altar, we give of ourselves. We ask God to forgive us of our sin. And then we say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Use me my Every breath that I have. Everything that's within me. So many have gotten burnt out, tired. They go, we sit on the benches on the sidelines and say, ah, let someone else do it. 
Let someone else do the work. But God's called us all. The two ladies I talked about that spoke to someone at Sam's, older ladies. I don't want to use the word elderly because I'm there too. (laughs) But they were willing, God impressed on one of them, invite that lady to come and sit with you. How simple is that? Be obedient to what the Spirit of God is calling you to do and surrender it all. Surrender it all. We give of ourselves. Tonight I want to finish up this message. I want to talk about just beyond that altar, there's another altar burning incense. And I'm going to talk about what that means. And also, if you're looking... If you need an answer from God, the place where I found it is around that altar in in communion with Him, where He speaks to us. If you're saying, Lord, I need to hear what you're saying to me, it's at an altar.